Bibles, please, and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, the message tonight entitled, Troublemakers Will Be Beaten. Acts 18, verses 14 through 17. And as you're turning there, I hope that you got a copy of the bulletin today. Last week I promised you a an insert. I read part of that insert from a an attorney down in Alabama who is a principal and one of the principal attorneys involved in this case where there is a lawsuit going on, first in Alabama, and now as you know it's another lawsuit of the same nature has reached the United States Supreme Court. And I hope that you read that insert. It's very important to understand what is going on and why it is going on. And we're going to see some legal precedent tonight in the way in which a court should rule. There will be certain things about Roman law that are distinct from American law, but there are also certain things in American law which actually track back to one of the principles that Gallio is using in this court case about the Apostle Paul in our text tonight. So we're in Acts chapter 18. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. Uh, we looked last time, you recall, at where to look for converts, or at the bottom of the barrel, in verses 8 through 11. So I'm going to read that uh, first because it's important for us to understand why the things that are going on in Corinth did go on a little bit later here in the text. Acts 18, beginning in verse 7. And he, that is Paul, departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So Paul had a promise here that's going to be fulfilled in our text tonight. Very unique way in which God fulfills that promise. But that's the promise that Paul got in verse 10. And that's the promise that we're going to see fulfilled tonight as we look a little bit later into our text. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And I think most of us, if we had been there for 18 months and no trouble seemed to be brewing and everything seemed to be, you know, quiet on the Western Front, so to speak, we might actually have sort of gotten um, complacent, might have sort of tried to kick up our heels and think, man, this is a nice place. I think I'll be here for a while. Just remember, when all seems to be calm and peace, that may be when you have your attack. Satan likes to do that. We need to keep our guard up all the time. That's what's going on here in this passage. The Apostle Paul is having success at Corinth. Anytime you and I have spiritual success, Satan will attack. Now, we can have success in worldly things, and the devil won't attack. We can have success in business. We can have success in all kinds of other things, in personal relations, uh, in family matters, in friends, and all this kind of thing. But the moment it takes a spiritual turn, you know that Satan has his antenna up, and that down the road, when you least expect it, Satan will begin to attack. So always keep your guard up. Now, remember where Paul was while this was going on. He's at Corinth. Uh, which was, as we said, perhaps the most perverted sex capital of the Greek-speaking world. And fascinating enough, it is people from this city who are going to complain about righteousness and law. Doesn't that strike you as sort of humorous? <laughs> I mean, it's Jews who are theoretically living righteously, but they're not complaining about the rest of the Corinthians. They're not complaining about all the other horrible things, the uh, activities that are going on in the city. What they do is they decide they're going to bring a guy to court who is doing right. Now, that's hypocrisy, folks. Unregenerates always try to make themselves look good while they make you look bad for doing right. So foundational to understanding what's happening in our text tonight is to remember that God gave Paul some very important, key, morally upright, pure leadership for the new church. Necessary because... When the church comes under attack, when Paul comes under attack, there have to be some people standing behind him. You know, years ago, that was the situation with this church here. 
There was a pastor, Dr. McIntyre, who stood for what was morally right. He got criticized for it. He got accused for it. He got blamed for it. He got slandered for it. All kinds of horrible things were said about him, sued on many different occasions for different kinds of things. But the church stood behind him. There was some strong key leadership in the church at that time. Oh, yes, there were problems, just like there were problems at Corinth. But, you know, the devil loves to attack. And the church needs to be united when the attack comes. Paul was a church planning missionary. And so obviously he needed some, in particularly a city like this, some morally pure, well-grounded men to fill the positions of leadership when God called him to move on. As we see from the first epistle to Corinthians, the kind of people that got saved at Corinth had some very sordid backgrounds and practices. So God, in his mercy, had the very most important key Jewish leader in the synagogue to be the principal convert to Paul's message, even when the rest of the synagogue reached that tipping point that we talked about several weeks ago, emphatically rejecting the gospel. And just remember, one person can be the tipping point. If you have a balancing scale that seems to be completely balanced, and you have one million grains of sand on this side and one million grains of sand on this side, one grain of sand can make the tipping point, and though it may be slow, eventually that side of the scale will tip faster and faster and faster and faster until it falls. The lesson from that is that each one of us is important in the balance that God has made in the body of Christ. Each one of us is important in family contexts, each one of us is important in church contexts. Each one of us is important in our national context. We gave an illustration of that about the lady who was really the key instigator of Mother's Day in the Mother's Day sermon not long ago. One person made a difference and now it's a national holiday. You are important in the plan of God. You've all heard the old adage that for want of a nail, a horseshoe was lost. For want of a horseshoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, a battle was lost. For want of a battle, the war was lost. For want of a nail, the war was lost. Too many people think, I don't count, I don't matter. But you matter. In the sovereign plan of God, he has put each one of us at a precise point in history for a specific purpose that we might fulfill his will. Are you doing, am I doing what God called us to do? To stand in the gap when the war, war rages most fiercely around us? For want of a nail, the war was lost. There's a tipping point, even with one grain of sand. We notice that next Paul, in verse 7 and 8, moves into the house right next door to the synagogue. And, of course, next door, I'm sure they were not very happy when they were having synagogue services. There are Christians over there busy cleaning the church, so to speak, and singing songs of praises and chattering joyfully on those Sabbath day mornings when they were very angrily discussing that all those Christians were breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> oh, dear people. We also noticed that God was beginning to fulfill his promise in Acts 16.31. God had made that promise, you remember, to the Philippian jailer. We're going to see a connection between Philippi and Corinth tonight in some principles that transfer from Philippi to Corinth. But there was a promise made at Philippi that is a promise repeated to Corinth. A promise in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 16, verses 31, the Philippian jailers just asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And we saw that four times in that Acts 16 passage, the emphasis is made on the salvation of the entire household of the Philippian jailer. That 
promise was specifically repeated to the Corinthians, a church filled with marriage problems. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 13 and 14, we looked at that. We'll not talk about it in detail again, but you remember that Paul said that in a case where even only one of the two in the couple is saved, the children are, in fact, he says, holy. The word used for saints. They're already set apart. They're already among those whom God has said that he is going to save at some point. And that's why moral purity is so important. We talked about that because it affects both you and your children. And I can't emphasize that point strongly enough. And Paul had written that specific issue to the Corinthians in chapter 6. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take them, the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. He quotes the marriage principle of Genesis chapter 2, verse 28, in the context of prostitution. The same kind of a union takes place in prostitution that takes place in the marriage bond. And it produces the same effect. Except instead of being a holy bond, it's a bond that's been polluted by that which is evil and vile and wicked. Fornication includes not only what we call premarital sex, but it also includes all the other forms of sexual perversion that were prevalent at Corinth and that have become prevalent here in the United States. So not only was Corinth like the United States, Corinth was in the church. That's why you need to have qualified leaders like Crispus, who was appointed, and we talked about him last week, the chief ruler of the synagogue and his family. That kind of a foundation gives hope to the church. But you need a foundation of qualified, fully committed leaders and their families. Fully committed. Oh, how hard it is to find committed leaders. Fully committed leaders and their families. Especially if you've got a church like Corinth or you live in a culture like the United States has become today just like Corinth. I ask the question again, do you pray every day that God will send us that kind of elders and deacons and trustees? I certainly hope so. So for 18 months, Paul's in Corinth leading people to Christ. He's meeting in the home of Justice, whose house, quote, joined hard onto the synagogue. That's probably the chief reason, as we said last week, that the Jews raised the rat and dragged Paul in front of the legal authorities. Not only did they hate the singing and preaching coming through the wall, they hated the lower class riffraff that kept showing up with all kinds of horrendous problems that Paul categorizes for us over in 1 Corinthians. And we noticed a minute ago the hypocrisy. <laughs> Look, here's a lawbreaker. We're dragging him in front of you, magistrate. But that was exactly the kind of people that filled the city of Corinth. They didn't raise a riot. They didn't drag anybody else to the magistrates. They were very selective in their complaint. And so the way that Gallio responds here in our text is actually an example, as I mo mentioned a moment ago, it's an example of a precedent that carries over into American legal system. The law must be applied in an even-handed manner. Or as my mom used to say, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. How many of you ever heard that? <laughs> Old saying, true saying. It embodies the legal principle that we see here. Under American law, a judge is not supposed to play favorites. If two equally situated parties are doing the same thing, the judge can't choose to penalize one party and give the other party a pass. That legal doctrine is found in the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Now we're talking modern law because we're going to see some modern applications, we hope correctly so, by our United States Supreme Court. But it goes all the way back to Rome. Think 2,000 years ago. Think of the establishment of the Roman legal system. One of the finest legal systems that ever started in the world, but of course because it was man-made, not God-given, uh, it ultimately collapsed. But it contained principles that are divine principles that we see brought over into American law. The Equal Protection Clause requires persons under like circumstances to be given equal protection in the enjoyment of personal rights and the prevention and redress of wrongs. Equal protection under the law means that no person or class of persons shall be denied the same protection of the laws which is employed by other persons or other classes in like circumstances in their lives, liberty, property, and in their pursuit of happiness. I'm quoting from different legal cases where this has been applied. 
Similarly situated persons must receive similar treatment under the law. Those are all quotations from various cases that have come before the United States Supreme Court. We hope that when Christians are put on trial, that will be seen that way. In American law, this basic principle has been extended to the rule of evidence, to the modes of procedure, to the prevention and redress of wrongs, and to the enforcement of contracts, provided, and there are three points here, provided that they are, number one, not applied to things which do not generally affect others, Number two, when the person charged is liable to no other or greater burden or charges than such as are laid upon others. And number three, when no different or greater punishment is enforced against them for the violation of the laws. You can't play favorites. Or you're not supposed to. There are some judges that do because they're human and many are unregenerate. And many have a certain social or political agenda that they want to see fulfilled. And that's why we see the decomposition and destruction of the American legal system today. It's because they no longer hearken back to the Bible as their ultimate standard for law and righteousness and why certain things are right and why certain things are wrong. And they're moved by the arguments that if everything is in flux and if everything is in an evolutionary state of process, things are getting better and you can, you can certainly shove aside the old mores if that's necessary to make way for the new and progressive ideas. It's not the way the founders of this country understood the law, nor the way in which our Constitution was written, nor the way in which our legal system was established, nor the Christian beliefs of the first court in this land. Dear people, do you pray for those in authority over us? We're going to see principles tonight. I mean, it's based here, this same kind of principle that we're going to see showing up tonight in the situation with Gallio. God already had a legal system in place and qualified man in place when Gallio was put in that position. He was brand new. Remember, we talked about that last week. He was brand new in that position. But God had been planning that in advance because he knew that there was going to be a point in time at which Paul was dragged in front of that court and God had made a promise to Paul that nobody's going to hurt you. Normally, if Paul had been dragged in front of a court like that, like at Philippi, where he was beaten, where he was thrown in jail, even though he was a Roman citizen, where he was put in shackles, God had made a promise about the legal system at this point. God made a promise about the people who might violate the legal system at this point. God has said, no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, because I have much people in this city. Folks, you can always depend on the promises of God. You can always depend on the promises of God. God had already put a legal system in place. God had already put a qualified man in place, Gallio, who had been trained in the system when Paul was dragged to court. God had already given Paul a guarantee of protection and success. Verse 9 and 10, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Paul had already had some unjust beatings. Fascinating. God turned the tables in our text tonight. You know, it's interesting that the law of harvest applies to unregenerates as well as to believers. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth of the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, he that soweth of the spirit shall of the spirit reap life ever, ever, everlasting. As you go through scripture, you discover that the law of harvest applies over and over and over and over and over again. God is faithful with that. What you sow, you reap. Now, God tonight is going to show how it works the other way around. How it works when the other side gets smacked around and the believers get exonerated. God gave Paul encouragement, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And a couple of weeks ago, you recall that we saw that same idea in Paul's epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Same thing he said to Paul that night, for I am with thee. 
so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Nobody's going to set on you in this city to hurt you. That brings us now to verse 12. When Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Baal and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. When we looked at those phrases last week, we learned several important lessons. Number one, and this is something all leaders should pay attention to, new leadership can always expect to inherit problems from former leadership. This affected people who have not had their way, sense that a new leader who doesn't know all the facts will be more open to hearing their case, to gain favor with a very vocal group of people, to avoid trouble as he's trying to get his feet on the ground, and he may possibly have sympathies with political and religious positions that were not held by the former leader. And, of course, he doesn't know the character of the people uh, who are screaming and yelling. Lesson number two that we learned was true religious freedom is always under attack when the religion is biblical Christianity. You don't find the other religions under attack. You don't find the worship of Dionysius, the god of wine, under attack. You don't find the worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of sex, under attack. You don't find the, the worship of Zeus under attack. All of those are things that the Jews hated. But what you find under attack, they had, they'd lived peacefully with all those other pagan religions and all the horrible things those other pagan religions did. But in their hypocrisy, the only thing they attacked was biblical Christianity. Same thing's true today. You find that the religious cases are principally centered around things that Christians do and things that Christians believe. And the attempted forcing of Christians to change their viewpoints and compromise with the world so that everybody can get along. But you don't find those same kinds of attacks against other religions. You don't find Muslims being dragged into court because they believe in jihad. It's quite different, isn't it? Actually, it's exactly the same thing that we see going on here in our text. That explains why the issue of same-sex marriage will affect our religious freedom. As I pointed out in my Mother's Day morning message, the legal precedent that paved the way, I'm talking legal precedent, where the theories of law were developed by the court. The legal precedent that paved the way for the sodomite movement goes back to the issue of contraceptives, birth control, and abortion. And then with this sodomite movement, the four daggers that have been used to slash motherhood. If the sodomites get their way, we lose our religious freedom. Read the insert that I put in your bulletin this morning. We noted last week that Gallio in our text is Junius Gallio, originally named Lucius Aeneas Novatus, the elder brother of Seneca. And we saw some very interesting connections with Seneca and then with Nero, because Nero was taught by Seneca. Why the Roman legal system was important. Why is it critical that this new leader would follow the law? Because the Jews accused the Christians of violating the law. That's what they're going to accuse you of, probably in the very near future. They're going to accuse you of violating the law if you stand for biblical moral principles. You will be dragged and said in court, this man or this woman refuses to comply with the laws of the United States of America. Fifty years ago, that was hardly thought possible. But that's what's coming. Are you prepared? The roots of equal protection showed up, fortunately, in our case, and in all of the odd places, at Corinth, a city famous for its licentiousness and law scoffing. Gallio was hard-nosed. He wouldn't have anything to do with restricting the religious freedom of the Corinthians. And I said last week, and I sure hope you can come on Wednesday evenings, because after we do this series on creationism, which is 12 weeks long, we have one more series in the, the, the one that we're doing right now that the world may know. We're going to do a 10 or 12 week series on creation. Fantastic series, brand new, hot off the press, just produced by the Institute for Creation Research. Those of you who read that magazine, which we pass out every time it shows up here, know that this has just been released by ICR. But following that, a series on the early church.
talking about all the ways in which the early church was persecuted. Folks, I'm trying to prepare us for what's coming. You must not miss it. You won't know what to do when it hits. What else can I say as your pastor? So here tonight, Gallio clearly understood the difference between criminal law and religious activity. He followed a procedure that guaranteed that the Jews would never again bring the same kind of trumped up charges and waste his time. He used a certain prerogative available in a Roman proconsul that's not available to American judges today. <laughs> I suppose a lot of people are thankful for that. But that particular procedure or that prerogative was very effective in keeping the courts from being cluttered with phony lawsuits and rigged trials. Now, there are fines today for people who bring frivolous lawsuits. But the way in which they dealt with frivolous lawsuits, where a Roman proconsul was involved, is the defendants could beat up the plaintiffs. <laughs> That's what we see in our text tonight. Wouldn't that be something? If every time a frivolous lawsuit was brought down here in, in one of the courts, say in Camden, that if it was a frivolous lawsuit and the judge says, that's a frivolous lawsuit, I'm not going to listen to that kind of stuff, that then the defendants could get up and beat up the plaintiffs who had brought the suit. You know what? There would be very few frivolous lawsuits. But that's what's taking place here tonight. When Paul was now about to open his mouth, verse 14, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. Now, at Corinth, a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness. <laughs> you know, it would really have to be pretty bad at Corinth, where Gallio would consider it such wicked lewdness that it couldn't be tolerated by the public. Can you see the hypocrisy of the Jews in trying to drag Paul in front of this court? Just remember, unregenerates don't play fair. But also, unregenerates do have some common sense. Some sense of moral absolutes, though they may not want to admit it, but God has given them a conscience. Romans chapter 2 makes that very, very clear. Romans 1, creation. Romans 2, conscience. Romans 3, special revelation. The ways by which man is accountable before God. That's how Paul makes the foundation of the entire epistle of Romans. Gallio had a conscience. Gallio knew what kind of city Corinth was. He had not just fallen off the turnip truck. He had not just come in from the country where everything was nice and idyllic. He knew what Corinth was like. And to have the Jews show up in court accusing the Apostle Paul of being wicked because he's teaching the Christian religion, Gallia says, people, are you nuts? This is Corinth. You're accusing a man who is preaching righteousness of being a lawbreaker? You're accusing a man who has never done anything that is criminal in its activity, never done anything that is so vilely immoral that it couldn't even be tolerated in Corinth? What in the world do you think you are doing bringing somebody like that to court? <laughs> I hope that our United States Supreme Court has the common sense to see what's going on with the current homosexual petition for so-called gay marriage and the destructive impact that it will have on the United States and the freedom of religion, not just the freedom of religion, the freedom of biblical Christian faith to be both believed and practiced. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. Already in American law, there is a basic principle that the courts can intervene in a case that involves a church or a Christian people if it is something that violates a common right of all. For example, a contract. But if it is a matter of church doctrine, 
And if they discover that that is the foundation for what's going on in the background, in the dark, behind closed doors, and that's the reason for the lawsuit, if that kind of thing is intermeddled, you know what? The courts wash their hands of it. They say, no, we're not going to de determine that. We're not going to determine the doctrine of the church. The church has the right to determine its own leaders. The church has the right to determine its own doctrine. That's the way the law stands right now. Gallio understood that principle, and Gallio puts it into practice here. He says, this is a problem that you guys have with your own law. I understand you Jewish law guys. I understand what your standards are. I understand that you don't, don't like what Paul is teaching, because after all, it is in conflict with what you guys believe. Paul, I mean, Gallio probably didn't know in detail everything about the Christian religion, or everything in detail about the Jewish law. But he understood the principle that he wasn't going to get involved in deciding a theological question. And he certainly wasn't going to judge under secular law a theological question. Praise God that our courts have established precedent for many, many, many years on that particular issue. Folks, remember, one grain of sand can tip the balance in the opposite direction. We have a very delicate balance that stands right now in the United States with a court case that's in front of our Supreme Court right now. And it could all slide the wrong way. Praise God it didn't here. It gives us an illustration in Scripture of the way things are supposed to go, though the Romans had, as I said, that proconsul uh, privilege, which <laughs> takes place here in this passage. If it be a matter of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from his judgment seat. You are wasting my time, guys. You get out of here. And the bailiff in the court probably took some kind of a rod and started smacking Sosthenes and the others that were with him. Okay, get out of the court. It says he drave them out. That's the kind of word that you use for driving a herd of animals. You use the old whip to them. You use the old rod to them. You get them out of the way. Look, next case. You guys are wasting my time. I got a lot of stuff to do today. Get out of here. Well, it says the Greeks took a cue from that. Verse 17, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. You see, he was a Roman proconsul. They were going to waste his time. They brought frivolous charges. There were defendants in this case. <laughs> and the plaintiffs had brought a frivolous charge. So we find all of a sudden the plaintiffs are getting beaten as a result of having brought the frivolous charge. Do you think they ever again in Corinth brought that kind of frivolous charge against the Christians? We certainly have no historical record of it. It's a very, very aggressive and very good way of stopping that kind of frivolous complaint against the Christians, and that's what happened here. Gallio cared for none of these things, and Paul, after this, tarried yet there a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria. Now, you remember, Sancria was one of those two ports where the goods were brought in or taken out, which were dragged over land through Corinth, where there's a canal today, but drag over land. And Sencrea, there was a very important person at Sencrea named Phoebe. And Phoebe was a messenger for the Apostle Paul. Oh, it's so interesting to see the connections in the text here. Now, as we look at that phrase, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. We're not told whether or not that's a reference to the Greeks in general who simply happened to be present in court that day, or, and this is a real possibility, whether it was the Greek converts that Paul had made while he was preaching for 18 months. Remember, the church at Corinth was a pretty rough church. If you read 1 Corinthians, you know that. The church at Corinth probably didn't have all the rough edges polished off after only 18 months of Paul being there. I suspect that those Greek converts would have been pretty upset by the hypocritical Jews dragging, charge to the, dragging Paul before the uh, proconsul on trumped-up charges. 
We can't prove it one way or the other. I sort of tend to lean that direction, having been in a number of churches and knowing the character of some of the rougher people in those churches. But in any case, Gallio used his proconsul prerogative and left the defendants exact justice against the head plaintiff, who in this case happened to be Sosthenes. So let's talk about Sosthenes for a minute. Sosthenes was obviously the successor to Crispus. Remember, Crispus had been the chief ruler of the synagogue. And now here it tells us that Sosthenes is the chief ruler of the synagogue. But Crispus has gotten converted. He's heard Paul's message. He probably sort of opposed it when Paul was bringing it in the synagogue. But after Paul started preaching next door, something was cogitating in Crispus's mind and Crispus, who knows, he may have come to Paul by night, like Nicodemus did in, in uh, John chapter 3, where he came to Jesus by night. He said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus proceeded to tell Nicodemus about the new birth. And Nicodemus trusted Christ and was saved. And we know that because when it comes time for Jesus' crucifixion, it's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea that beg the body of Jesus Christ and wrap it in fine linen and all the spices, and bury it. Josephus tells us some other things, too, about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and what they suffered at the hands of the Jews as a result of that. Who knows? Maybe the same kind of thing happened with Sosthenes, where he came to Paul by night. But he clearly got saved. It says so in the text. He clearly became a believer. He went over to the other side. My, how the Jews must have hated him. He was a traitor to them. So they wanted to make sure when they put the new guy in place that they got a man who wasn't going to go over. <laughs> they chose a guy by the name of Sosthenes. Sosthenes is the one who's leading the charge against Paul before the Roman proconsul. He's the one who's in court. He's the plaintiff in court representing the Jewish synagogue. And he's the one that gets beaten as a result of that. He is a successor to Crispus, who was removed from being the chief ruler of the synagogue. But you know, it's really funny. God in his wisdom, and I think to somewhat of a humorous extent, put us this second lead man into the synagogue who was going to get saved. Did you know that Sosthenes got saved? You know, here God is still trying to teach the Jews at the synagogue in Corinth, a lesson. This is the grace of God still to those guys who are being stubborn and rebellious and recalcitrant and, and obnoxious and hypocritical, very clearly hypocritical in the context of Corinth, that God will save whom he will and when he will. The Jews probably had thought that appointing Sosthenes, they'd have a strong anti-Christian leader. And obviously he was, at least for a point, because he's leading the charge against Paul here. But you know something? And what a wonderful thought this is. God likes to crack the hardest nuts. Just like God saved Paul, the chief persecutor of the church, he saved Sosthenes, the chief persecutor of Paul. We'll see that in just a moment. Back to the idea of beatings. Troublemakers will be beaten. Beatings were, and will someday in the future be, a standard form of punishment. Beatings are still used today as a form of punishment in Singapore. When you break the law in Singapore, you get what's called a caning. They bring you in front of the court, and they beat you with a cane. You know, Singapore has a very, very low crime rate. If you're caught bringing any drugs, illegal drugs, into Singapore, it's the automatic death sentence. doesn't matter what country you came from or what citizenship you are. It's the automatic death penalty if you try to drag drugs into Singapore. Fairly effective legal system for keeping down the crime rate. And they still use caning because caning works. We see some of the other beatings in Scripture. Mark 13, verse 9, for example. Jesus prophesies it's going to happen in the future. He says, but take heed to yourselves, is Mark 13, 9, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. We find that Jesus talks about this in his parables. He says, the servant which knew his Lord's will, this is Luke 12, 47, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten. 
with many stripes. It's an effective form of punishment for those who have done wrong. Now, those who have done right will be beaten also. But you know, the one who does right doesn't correct because he's already in the right spot. It's the one who does wrong who is corrected by the beating. Luke 12, 48, next verse. These two go together. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will require the more. In other words, it's proportional. God's chastening is that way too. God's chastening is proportional. And God's judgment of the wicked is proportional. They're all cast into hell, but there are different levels of punishment. We've talked about that in the past. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. We find that here, the council, the, the Sanhedrin has been discussing, what are we going to do with the apostles? And it says, to him they agreed when they had called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. But, of course, they continued to speak in the name of Jesus. They had a higher authority. So I think Paul was probably surprised since he had been beaten under the Roman legal system before and may have been expecting it as Corinth as well, a legal system which was gone awry at Philippi. Acts 16:37. Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Paul knew his legal rights. He mentions it again in 2 Corinthians 11, 25. He says, Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. Paul was beaten at least three occasions with rods. But you know, as we look here at this situation with Sosthenes, God clearly used the incident for good in the life of Sosthenes. God used this incident in the life of Sosthenes to draw him to Christ. Listen to what Paul writes just a few years later as he communicates with the church at Corinth. Remember, we're talking about Corinth. Corinth was where that synagogue was, where Crispus had been the ruler, then when Sosthenes had been the ruler. And then after Paul had been there 18 months, that trial took place. And then it says Paul was there for a much longer period of time. And during that period of time, apparently Sosthenes came to Christ. Listen to what Paul writes. The very first verse of the very first book that Paul writes back to Corinth after he has left there going on his missionary journeys. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. <laughs> what a difference from being the second chief ruler of the synagogue who opposed Paul and dragged him to court to being called Sosthenes, our brother. Do you get that? Sosthenes not only got saved, but Sosthenes became a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine how exciting that would be if you got to travel with Paul and be with him every day and listen to him pray over every meal and listen to him as you're walking along the journey and he didn't just walk along and mumble to himself. I mean, the Apostle Paul was a man impelled to communicate Christ and he'd be teaching and discipling and training those who were following him just like the Lord Jesus Christ did with those who were following him and who walked with him for three years. Oh, if you've been missing our Wednesday evenings and the way in which Jesus as the master teacher was training his disciples so that they could carry on after he left, Paul knew that his time was limited. But he was doing everything he could to communicate, to teach, to train, to repeat, to repeat, to repeat, to repeat. Some of you don't like how I repeat things. Repetition is the mother of learning. Dear people, Sosthenes had the privilege of traveling with Paul. God took Paul the persecutor and made him in the chief apostle who reached the Gentiles. Paul took Sosthenes, the chief persecutor of Paul, 
saved him and made him into a traveling companion with Paul so he could be discipled. Do we have an amazing God? An amazing God who does things that we would never do because God controls the future. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God and Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. Paul writes back and he says you all remember Sosthenes don't you? He's with me now. He's joining me as I send this letter to you. He was one of you. He like Christmas became a a leader there in that church. But God left Crispus there to be your stable leadership and God called Sosthenes to be a missionary with me. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God that is given you in, by Christ Jesus that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. This to a church that have been filled with the worst kind of reprobates, who are saved out of the worst kinds of situations that you can imagine. Why? Verse 9, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sosthenes became the traveling companion of Paul and sent his greetings with Paul in the very first letter Paul wrote back to the church at Corinth. There's a lesson in this for us. Never assume that bad things are not for your good. Sosthenes somehow learned that even persecution and suffering can be for our good. Remember I mentioned there's a connection between Corinth and Rome, and between Corinth and Philippi. That principle of God working all things together for our good is in Romans chapter 8. It's in the context of suffering persecution. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many creatures, brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? What was happening to Paul in Corinth? Somebody was laying something to the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Paul was being condemned there at Corinth, wasn't he? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's what Paul was going through. What he'd gone through on all of his missionary journeys, what looked like it was going to happen again at Corinth. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. This is in the context, folks. Romans 8.28 is in the context of suffering and persecution. We like to take it out of its context. We like to make it sound like it's a bed of roses and everything is hunky-dory and you know, peaches and cream and all sorts of cotton candy floating by while we pluck grapes and pop them into our mouths watching the silly soap operas on TV. Persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But here's the difference. Here's what transformed Paul. Here's what transformed Crispus. Here's what transformed Sosthenes. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. I mean, he includes everything, past, present, and future, and the supernatural realm as well as the natural realm. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now remember the connection between Rome and Corinth. It's given to us in the very last verse of the book of Romans. Romans 16, 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Written to the Romans from Corinthus. The epistle to the Romans was written from Corinth. For Paul just had gone through all these things that we read in our text tonight. And sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Sancria. Folks, the New Testament is a unit. It is a unit. See it as interrelated. Each of Paul's epistles are interrelated. The people are interrelated. The people are brothers and sisters in Christ. The people love one another. They care for one another, even though they're separated by distances and time in a way that you and I are not because we're connected with cell phones. We're connected with the Internet. These are hand-carried messages by a woman who served the church at Corinth. Aren't you glad she was faithful and didn't stop along the way or lose it someplace or get it messed up with her dirty laundry or stuck in the garbage can with some rubbish because she wasn't being very careful? We wouldn't have Romans if, if this woman, if Phoebe was not a faithful woman. How important it is to be a faithful woman. Paul then continued a long time after that initial 18 months at Corinth, during which time apparently Sosthenes came to Christ. Because verse 18 says, Paul, after this, tarried yet a good while there, and then took his leave of the brethren, sailed to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head and sent Crea for he had a vow. We're going to talk about that vow next week. Thus, Corinth, the church with the greatest needs. Listen. Corinth, the church with the greatest needs, as you look at all the New Testament churches was where God chose to let Paul stay for one of the longest periods of his ministry. You know, I said there was a connection with Philippi. We already saw the connection where that promise was made to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, and then it's restated over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, chapter 7, about household salvation. We see now another connection between Philippi and Corinth, just like we saw a connection between Rome and Corinth. They looked at themselves as the body of Christ. Paul expressed the sentiment about having to stay at Corinth, as he also wrote to the Philippians, for a longer period of ministry. Philippians 1.20 According to my earnest expectation, my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. We all know verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. Verse 23 and 24. For I am a straight betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You know, Paul got tired both of the war and got tired in the war. And he knew that when he stepped out of this mortal body, or as Shakespeare put it, when we shuffle off this mortal coil, that he'd be with Christ. And that would be far better than anything he had ever known. How he yearned for it. I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Verse 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It was more needful for Paul also to be at Corinth for a longer period of time because that was the church with the greatest need. Verse 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Paul gives us a lesson here that we all of us need to learn. Paul had learned the principle of contentment in his walk of faith even in suffering. And apparently Sosthenes had learned this as well. 
Here's that principle stated to the Philippians, then stated to young Timothy, then stated in the epistle to Hebrews, which we've already seen in parallel with what was going on there at Corinth. First Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Whether the state is in prison, whether it's proclaiming the gospel, whether it's being hounded by persecutors, whether it's being beaten, whether it's been being illicitly dragged in front of a judge on false charges, Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Not just barely tolerating it, but content. Praise God, I'm in the center of God's will. That's the most important thing to know. You know, if you can know for sure that you are squarely in the center of God's will, then nothing else matters. Really. If you know for sure that you're not in this situation because of your own stupidity, or you're not in this situation because you compromised, or you're not in this situation because you got involved in sin, but you're in the situation because you know that you are in the center of God's will. You can be at peace. You can be at rest. You won't be agitated. You won't be worried. You won't be fearful. You will be content. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. First Timothy 6, 8. Most of us are not content unless we have a whole lot more than that. Are you content in whatsoever state you are, therewith to be content? Are you having food and raiment content? That's what Paul wrote to Timothy, another young missionary pastor. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's what Paul heard from Jesus in the vision at Corinth. Don't be afraid, for I will be with thee. He repeats that to the Hebrews. I will never leave you nor forsake you. When we understand that principle, it gives us a sense of stability. It gives us a sense of satisfaction. It gives us a sense of peace. It gives us the sense of contentment because all the things of this world are going to pass away. All the things of this world are going to pass away. But if our heart is eaten up with the things of this world, the covetousness of which Paul speaks, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such, with such things as you have. If we can get that point, suddenly our life is filled with perfect calm. Suddenly we realize, I want nothing more than God has for me. I want nothing less than God has given to me or put on my plate. What I want to do is focus on God's will with what he's doing in my life today. Some good lessons here in this passage. God saving someone whom you and I thought probably would never be saved. He was chosen to replace Crispus because they thought that guy will never compromise with the Christians. That guy got beaten. What you sow you reap. But God used that in his life to draw him to Christ and make him a disciple of the Apostle Paul, a traveling companion, so he might carry the faith to others. What's God been doing in your life to disciple you, to teach you and to train you, not merely so that you'll have an intellectual head knowledge, but so that you will begin to apply the principles that we're learning here in the book of Acts. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the things that we've looked at tonight and for the marvelous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Father, you are a good God, a gracious God, a loving God, a kind God, a God who reaches down into the slime pits of history and drags us out of the miry clay and sets our feet upon a rock and puts a new song in our mouth. You fill our lives with joy and gladness. You give us perfect peace. You teach us contentment. You teach us what joy it is to serve you, knowing that regardless of what life is like here, that someday we'll depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, it's needful for us to be here now. It's not a death wish. It's not a suicide wish that Paul had. He recognized that as long as God left him here, he had a responsibility, a responsibility to communicate Christ. Help us, Father, to understand our responsibility and the blessing that comes from being a good and faithful and diligent service servant in the purposes and in the plan of Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 428. When you get worried, just remember God will take care of you. Number 428, let's stand to sing all four verses. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. That's what God promised to Paul there at Corinth, wasn't it? Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Let's stand and sing all four verses, number 428.